They say that depression is a complex condition that often involves feelings of hopelessness or pessimism and feelings of guilt, worthlessness, or helplessness. The anime, Neon Genesis Evangelion, portrays the theme of loneliness and depression distinctively in a manner that allows the series narrative and protagonists to express devastation. It also explores the darker sides of the human psyche and even draws into question fundamental ideas of existence. The series revolves around Shinji Ikari, a teenage boy who is summoned to the fortress city of Tokyo 3 by his estranged father, Commander Gendo Ikari, for a single purpose to pilot a humongous mecha called an Evangelion to protect Tokyo 3 from genocidal monstrosities known as Angels alongside two other teenagers, Rei Ayanami and Asuka Langley Soryu. But before we dive deeper into the analysis of the series, it's important to go over the background of the show's director, Hideaki Anno. Anno was not in a good place when he started work on Evangelion in 93. At this point, he had only been in the animation industry for a decade. As a kid, Anno had a fascination with the creative world of manga, anime, and live-action TV dramas. In college, he had risen to moderate acclaim by creating impressive, breathtaking animations for conventions, and even an Ultraman fan film in which he played the titular character. In December 1983, Anno founded the animation studio Gainax, but not before working with Hayao Miyazaki on the pre-Ghibli film Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind, in which he lent his own apocalyptic stylings to the film's costume design. After very few hits and many flops at Gainax, the stressful life Anno found himself leading as a director of a newly founded animation company began to take its toll on him. During the production of the series Nadia, Seeker of the Blue Water, he found the process so crushing that he dropped out of production entirely for several episodes, and after a collapse of a movie sequel to Royal Space Force, The Wings of Hanea Mies, by his own reckoning, he completely shut down for four years. It was at this moment that his friend Toshimichi Atsuki told him to bring him something, anything, and he would see to it that it get greenlit. And this is where Neon Genesis Evangelion comes into existence. now the subject of depression is what gives the show the most common theme of psychoanalysis, and as Evangelion is what we would consider a character study, it's most visible within the characters themselves. Shinji, Asuka, Rei, and even Masato all have deep psychological traumas in relations to their parents. Another unfamiliar ceiling. Of course. In this whole city, there's no place that's familiar. Shinji Ikari, the main protagonist of the series, is a very distant and self-loathing individual who epitomizes the introvert personality by concealing his true identity a la the hedgehog's dilemma. A metaphor about the hardships of individual closeness, and like humans, hedgehogs, in the effect of coming closer, end up hurting one another. So therefore, creating distance amongst each other is necessary to prevent future pain. This explains how walled off Shinji is and his maladroit encounters with the female characters in the series and his reluctancy to solidify lasting relationships. He has become content to live in the imaginary shell that is his happy place, believing that expressing his true self will cause unintended harm to himself and others. Shinji has severe insecurities and social anxiety from the death of his mother and his father abandoning him at a young age. His reaction to his father summoning him to pilot the Eva after he had abandoned him all those years ago is quite paradoxical, though it is evident just from the first episode that Shinji holds a great deal of resentment towards his father. So, you're asking me to take this thing and go out there and fight? Correct. How can you do this to me? I thought you didn't want me. Why? 
Why did you have to call me now, Father? Because I have a use for you. He chooses to keep himself isolated while living with Misato, who is essentially Shinji's caregiver, by listening to his Walkman on loop. He only engages with others when someone else, like classmates Toji and Kensuke, make the first move. Considering that Shinji's interaction with them is with Toji clocking him for indirectly injuring Toji's sister in his first time piloting an Ava robot, you almost can't blame him. Throughout the show, every relationship Shinji experiences ends up causing him some sort of pain, from simple disappointment to being forced to kill the one person whom he truly bonded with. But more on that later. To further illustrate Shinji's hatred towards his father, let's take a look at the episode, The Choice of Life. So Nerve built a new Ava, which went berserk and turned out to be the 13th Angel. Shinji senses that there's still someone piloting it, but Gendo demands that Shinji kill it. He refuses, and as a result, Gendo puts Shinji's Ava on dummy mode, making Shinji unwittingly beat the fourth child to near death. At the end of the episode, the fourth child is revealed to be Toji. In the next episode, A Man's Battle, he decides not to pilot an Ava again after what he was forced to do to Toji. But then, he eventually returns to pilot again in the last minute. Throughout the show, there have been several instances where Shinji has cracked under the pressure and given up, but then eventually returns. The reason for this is because Shinji is piloting the Ava to get approval from his father. But how does one explain Shinji's desire for praise from a man he clearly hates? That was good work, Shinji. My father called me by my name. I was praised by my father. Will you live the rest of your life regurgitating and redigesting those few pleasant memories? If I trust their words, it's enough. Enough to keep me alive. A Freudian analysis of Shinji, especially in the context of the Oedipal Complex, provides a partial answer, both to this paradoxical relationship with his father and to the overriding question of why he chooses the constructed image of self. In the Oedipal Complex, the son fears the father since the father holds the power of castration, preventing the son from fulfilling his mother's desire. This power held by the father could provide an explanation as to why Shinji hates Gendo. However, because of the fear of castration, the son wants to please his father in some sort of way, even regardless of this hatred. What Shinji truly desires is love and acceptance, but the Ava isn't an endpoint of his journey. It's a mechanism through which he's allowed to be challenged on the slow and painful road to loving himself. That's Shinji's internal insurmountable villain. In episode 16, when he is praised for his test scores, he overextends, and as a result, he gets defeated for aiming higher than he's capable of. And now, with no alternative, he's left to die. Only able to survive because of his will to live and see everyone else again, was able to truly awaken the strength of Ava 1. The only character Shinji ever truly connected with on a personal level throughout the series was Kaoru Nagisa. Karu appears in the third to last episode of the series, in which he ends up dying. He is both the final pilot of the Avas and the final angel, disguised as a human. As such, he acts as a symbol of oneness between angels and humanity. When Shinji meets Karu, he is very distraught and traumatized because of the recent events that happened all around him. Therefore, he had no one to talk to and nowhere to go. Karu was the first person in the series to show an unconditional love for Shinji, giving him the acceptance and appreciation he had been aiming for the entire series. You are delicate like glass, especially your heart. I am? Yes, and worth earning my empathy. Empathy? I'm saying I love you. Once it's revealed that Karu was an angel, Shinji feels betrayed and manipulated. He was forced into killing him with his own bare hands, which hurt him that he had to kill the only person he ever loved. And this really brought him to an all-time low. With how frequently Shinji has been hurt by people, he doesn't really like anyone. He welcomes death and wishes to return to nothingness, yet he's too scared and too indecisive to kill himself. Shinji's lowest point is seen at the start of the end of Evangelion, where he seeks solace in an unconscious Asuka. What starts off as a heartwarming moment turns into an act of selfishness. Shinji needs Asuka to survive for his own selfish desires. As a human being, all she's good for to him is someone to help him give him a reason to live. After unintentionally revealing her breast, he pleasures himself in a truly disgusting and narcissistic act. I'm so fucked up. It's in this very moment that Shinji has become very much akin to the person whom he hated and rebelled against throughout the show, his father. As Shinji's mental world collapses, 
third impact had at last been initiated, and the physical world begins to end as well. Ultimately, Shinji is given a choice, either leave the world as it is, or embrace instrumentality. We are given a perspective into his mind. In the first perspective, which takes place in a park, two girls invite a young Shinji over to build a sandcastle. These girls have beady eyes, much akin to dolls. One has blue hair, and the other has red hair. One could argue that this is how Shinji perceives Rei and Asuka, as dolls. The girl's mother calls to them so they can go home, leaving Shinji all alone, making him feel miserable. We then cut to a scene between him and Asuka, arguing about how cruel she was to him, and how unsupportive he was to her. I want to stay with you, Asuka, and I want to help you, but I don't know what to do. And don't do anything. Don't come near me. All you ever do is hurt me. Also, it's important to note the callback where Asuka says mama in her sleep, but she accidentally kisses Shinji. This is where we get an understanding of the relationship between Shinji and Asuka. Asuka likes Shinji, but she isn't sure how to express that. You really think you can ever know me? You think you can even help me? Don't make me laugh. I can't believe how arrogant you are. How can I ever understand you if you won't say anything? You never talk to me, but you expect me to understand you. That's impossible! Much of the psychological sequences in the movie are about taking what is typically kept inside and making it external. A particularly notable line in this scene is when Asuka insinuates that Shinji is only asking for her help because he's scared of Rei and Misato. You're afraid of Misato and the first child! You're afraid of your mother and father too! So now you come running to me! No, I because need you to help that's me. the easiest way to keep from getting hurt! You never even love yourself! You're all you have and you never even learn to like yourself! On one level that's true, but they are mother figures to him. Asuka is the only prominent female in his life that isn't a mother figure to him, and it represents growth that he'd seek help from her rather than retreat into the arms of someone who will always accept him. The build-up to Shinji lashing out at Asuka and himself is a display of rage unlike anything we have ever seen from him. Somebody help me! Don't leave me alone! Don't abandon me! Please don't kill me! Because of all the torment Shinji has been through his whole life, he wishes death upon everyone, and thus begins instrumentality. Nobody cares whether or not I exist. Nothing ever changes. So they can all just die. It's in this scene where Gendo evaluates his poor treatment of Shinji throughout his life. He thought that keeping his distance from Shinji was for the best, but in actuality, that's where all his problems came from. Were you afraid of Shinji? I didn't believe that anyone could love me. I never deserved to be loved. Had Akari been a more attentive father and shown Shinji some affection, perhaps Shinji would not have been so messed up, and he wouldn't have spent his whole life on a quest to reunite with his deceased wife. It's also important to note that Shinji's experience of instrumentality is quite literally being inside his mother. Rei has the body of Yui, and in instrumentality, we see him fused with her. So much of his experience in the series is about trying to get to his mother, to rediscover her. In the Eva, he feels right at home because it is essentially her womb. Shinji's decision in the end isn't so much about leaving instrumentality. It's about leaving his mother behind and being born into the real world again. This is made clear when Shinji says goodbye mother near the end of the film. While Shinji decides his life is worth living, his return to a barren and ravaged reality reminds us all that changing her perspective on life won't instantly alter it. Shinji must continue to strive to attain happiness. No one can simply hand it to you on a silver platter. I still don't know where my happiness lies. I'll still think about why I'm here and whether or not it was good to come back. But that's just stating the obvious over and over. I am myself. Evangelion is about being alone, about feeling alone, and coming to terms with loneliness. But Shinji is not alone in feeling alone. Much of Shinji's traumas and insecurities are also mirrored in Asuka Langley's Soryu, Misato Katsuragi, and to a degree, Rei Ayanami. 
Now, Rei and Shinji are very similar to each other in many ways. Like Shinji, she is socially detached, possibly much more detached, and in addition, talks to no one and often carries a dull expression all the time. Despite her peculiar history and lack of emotions, however, Rei is a very important symbol of the search of individuality, as well as the value of one's own existence. You don't want to be by yourself, correct? We are many, but you are alone. You hate it, don't you? That is what it is to be lonely. That is what your mind is. It is what fills your soul. You are that sorrow. Born in a laboratory in the lower levels of Nerve, Rei is a clone created from both the DNA of Gendo Akari's dead wife, Yui, and of the creature known as Lilith. Rei does not have a soul of her own since she is a clone, but she carries a soul within her, Lilith's soul. Like Shinji, Rei seems insecure about her life, her value, and her individuality. And probably rightfully so. Should she die, she would be replaced by another version of her. Despite the fact that Rei remains emotionless for most of the series, she actually makes a lot of progress into analyzing herself. A good example of this is in episode 14. At first, Rei sees herself not as a human, but rather an object. This is the self that can be seen, and yet this is not like that which is myself. A strange feeling. My body feels as if it is melting. I can no longer see myself. My form, my shape, fades from view. Awareness dawns of someone who is not me. She cannot feel human emotions and is regarded by Gendo as a tool to be used for third impact. Then along came Shinji. Their common problems about finding a place in society almost makes them kindred spirits. The fact that Rei is born of Yui's blood increases their connections even more. When Shinji is nice to her, Rei begins to feel accepted. No one had ever done anything for her aside from Gendo. It's worth noting that when Shinji picks up her room for her, she blushed, and for the first time in her life, she shows a sign of gratitude. We can see that she begins to evolve as the series goes on. She begins to experience some emotions, and suddenly becomes confused by the way Shinji treats her. Being the clone of Yui Akari both explains and complicates Shinji's affection for Rei, which shows a degree of Oedipus complex in his case. In Freudian psychoanalysis, Oedipus complex refers to the young boy's desire to have a sexual relation with his mother, and sees his father as a competitor for her affection. Now we've already made it clear that Shinji has a very strained relationship with Gendo, and if Rei is a clone of his mother, then Shinji fits perfectly into this Freudian case. In episode 6, when Shinji wakes up, he thinks his mother is watching him, but in actuality, it's Rei who is by his side. Her role then becomes ambiguous as the series progresses. Now not only is she a friend and a potential love interest for Shinji, but also a mother figure that Shinji lacked growing up. Much of this also relates to Shinji's tensions with Gendo. Am I a substitute? Yes! That's got to be it! He abandoned me because he already had Ayanami! As if you didn't already run away yourself. In the end of Evangelion, Shinji explores his existential crisis with Rei, a scene that can be seen as a mother-to-son talk as Rei asks Shinji what he really wants. She is almost guiding him into making a decision on accepting the human instrumentality project or not. Rei and Yui can now be seen as one. While Shinji seems to think about a lot of things, ranging from the value of his existence to how good or bad his life is, Rei concentrates on the journey for identity. She believes that while her perception of herself is significant, it is also important to consider how others perceive you. By examining how others view you, you can better understand yourself. As shown in episode 26, your existence is almost meaningless without someone else to relate with because you are alone, with nothing to justify your existence. Rei takes his philosophy into account, and with it, she creates an identity for herself. It's clear when Rei says, When I am of no use anymore, he will abandon me. I've prayed for the day he would abandon me. But now, now I fear it. That she has attained relevance for her life. Are you lonely? Are you alone?
Next, let's talk about Asuka. Like Shinji, Asuka exhibits a similar desire to be lauded by others, and similarly constructs the identity of being an Ava pilot around that desire. But unlike Shinji, who views piloting in Ava as an obligation, Asuka takes pride in piloting and often ostracizes those who don't see eye to eye with her. I thought it was bad when Shinji was nice, but when an emotionless, wind-up doll like you starts being sympathetic, I'm doomed! I am not a doll. You are! You do anything you're ordered to, don't you? You'd kill yourself if your commander told you to, wouldn't you? Of course. She's brash, arrogant, and hopelessly insecure about her usefulness. What the show does so well is that it chips away at Asuka, as well as the others, time and again, to break her down and bring her issues to the forefront more and more. And though Asuka is cocky, arrogant, and mean-spirited on the surface, her personality stems from a place of hurt. Asuka's mother slowly went insane and would often say abusive things towards her. Asuka, come to heaven with me. Please don't kill me. No, I'm not Mama's doll. I'll think for myself and I'll live for myself. She also stumbled across her mother's hanging body when she committed suicide. Having her mother commit suicide after neglecting her and having her father be unfaithful caused some major issues with Asuka. Her parents ignoring her led her to crave being needed and noticed. She believed using the Ava was the way for her to be needed and for people to pay attention to her. Her mother's cold treatment of her led to her being overly hostile to those around her. Another reason for Asuka's hostility towards others stems from her willingness to grow up and mature so fast to establish herself as an independent individual. You're back early. I thought you were going out to dinner too. No, oh, my date was even more boring than you. So while he was standing in line for the roller coaster, I took a train back here. That seems kind of cold. This is evident when she tries to establish a relationship with Kaji. When she is constantly reminded by either Kaji or Masato that she's still a child, she starts to get hostile. Asuka, you're still a child. Those things can wait until you've grown up a little. I am a grown up! Just look at me, Please look at me! This is also the main reason why she won't accept her inner feelings towards Shinji. And while we're on the topic, it's important that we further break down the relationship between Asuka and Shinji. As I've already mentioned earlier, Asuka likes Shinji, but she isn't sure how to express that. It's important to keep in mind that they're both 14 and are so emotionally compromised that they don't understand what it means to be in a healthy relationship or even express their emotions in a healthy way. Now, Shinji and Asuka share the same trials and tribulations, the same emotional pitfalls, and they're basically in the same situation. They're two sides of the same coin, essentially. Let's take a closer look at the mama scene in episode 9. With Misato gone, Asuka decides to distance herself from Shinji for the night, but then she lies down beside him, thinking he's asleep. Shinji attempts to kiss her too, thinking she's asleep. Asuka then whispers Mama as she is suffering from her own trauma. Shinji gets away from her, saying the following. You're just a child yourself. In episode 15, Asuka asks Shinji if he wants to kiss her out of boredom. Clearly, neither of them had been in this situation before, and Shinji is more nervous than Asuka, and as a result, the kiss was actually quite awkward. What's wrong? You look upset. That's because you kissed me, you jerk! Throughout the show, the two of them are seen arguing, and in one instance in school, Toji and Kensuke referred to them as newlyweds. Uh-oh, the newlyweds are fighting. <laughs> The core issue with their relationship is how bullheaded they are. Asuka won't show her affection because even though she likes Shinji, she doesn't think he's that great, hence her fake love for Kaji. For Asuka, Kaji is an extension of her obsession with being an adult, so being in a relationship with him could be the definite proof that she could be grown up too. As she becomes more and more conflicted about her own feelings and how she feels about Shinji, she becomes a less useful pilot. Fundamental feelings of inadequacy and worthlessness drive Asuka to proclaim herself the best at whatever she sets out to do, and her fear of abandonment is allayed by convincing herself she doesn't need anybody, 
When it becomes apparent that she's, in fact, not the best Ava pilot, she begins a mental collapse that parallels Shinji's. Who the hell is okay? How could it get any worse? That little bitch! That little bitch Ray rescued me! Don't you know that I'd rather have died? I hate her! I hate you, Shinji! I hate everything! In the end of Evangelion, Asuka suddenly realizes that her mother was with her the entire time through her Ava 2 unit, and she proceeds to dominate the mass production Avas in a fit of anger and pride. Then her power runs out and she realizes she never wanted to die, despite her previous inclination of hating everything. Then she is brutally defeated. She realized too late that she wanted to live. Her desire to be useful is shown one last time as she desperately tries to make an Ava move with no power. In the end of the movie, whether through Shinji or her own volition, she chooses to reject instrumentality and is reincarnated on the beach where she reacts to Shinji both choking her and presumably a delayed reaction to what happened in the hospital scene. She chooses to take the burden of the world rather than the bliss of instrumentality. With Asuka, we see a character who appears entirely confident in themselves, only to realize that they're still an insecure child who is unable to come to terms with their own shortcomings. Asuka entrenches herself so far in the idea that she's a good pilot and that she's the best that any evidence to the contrary causes her to break. Having her relive her past trauma makes her the very thing she mocks Shinji of being useless. I hated my father, and I hated being a good child. I hate it. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of keeping myself clean. I'm tired of pretending to be pure and noble. I'm so tired of it all. And now we turn our attention to Misato Katsuragi. Misato is a captain, and eventually major, for Nerve. On the surface, she has a very cheerful and optimistic personality, and can be a bit immature at times. She is extremely caring and will do all that she can do to ensure that all life in her hands is kept alive and well, whether at home or while on command of a battle. But like Shinji and Asuka, Misato has a dark past and some trust issues of her own. As a child, her father was immersed in his work, barely ever seeing Misato or her mother. As a result, this caused Misato to develop a hatred for her father, although he brought her on a top secret mission to Antarctica. When the second impact occurred, Misato was saved by her father by being placed in a capsule for safety. By showing unconditional love in the end, instead of showing love throughout their father-daughter relationship, Misato has a different perception of love, feelings, and relationships than others. Her father's death had a very big impact on her, causing her to go mute for a portion of her life. Remarked by Ritsuko, it was only during college that Misato started to talk and got to reaching out more thanks to Ritsuko and Kaji. Next, I want to touch upon the relationship between her and Shinji. Misato agrees to take on the role of Shinji's caretaker at the start of the show, and she's inexplicably attached to him by virtue of initially seeing and understanding the conflict that he has with his father. He wouldn't have sent me a letter unless he needed me for something. Hmm, sounds like you don't get along with your dad. Oh, you sound just like me. When she notices that Shinji isn't in good terms with his father, this is a reflection of the negative relationship she had with her own father. This is why Misato chooses to involve herself past the role of commanding officer and into the role of parental figure, to reach out to Shinji, who she sees as a reflection of herself. Despite knowing how vital he is to Nerve's missions and the fate of humanity, Misato has given Shinji multiple instances to forget his life as an Ava pilot and live a peaceful life. I was projecting all of my dreams, hopes, and purpose onto you. I know that it's been a huge burden for you, but we, and by that I mean everyone at NERV, have had no choice except to place our future in your hands. I want you to remember that. The end justifies the means. But because he always returns, she gets upset with him whenever he doesn't listen to instructions or make stupid or unnecessary decisions on and off the battlefield. It's not something that comes to me naturally, but... Ayanami and you and Miss Ritsuko. Stow that line of what? crap! This has nothing to do with any of us. If you don't like it, get out of here. Just forget all about Ava and us and get back where you came from. 
Regardless, her care for him is evident as she constantly tries to give him the best chance of survival, even defying various nerve higher-ups to keep him safe. Her care for him is most evident as she appears devastated many times when she thinks Shinji is dead. Even after trauma separates them both, Misato is willing to do everything in her power to keep Shinji safe, even if that means sacrificing herself, which makes her death in the end of Evangelion all the more tragic. But more on that later. And this segues into the more intimate side of the relationship, how it hinges on the rapid desire and forced need to reach adulthood, and how it develops at all. But first we must discuss how Misato looks at relationships in general. Misato's view on relationships in this series is really fractured. She treats relationships at face value and uses sex to feel less lonely, but that's not to say that she's shallow or that she uses just about anyone as the sentence implies. Her main relationship with Kaji ended when she was afraid she liked him due to him resembling her father's personality, alongside having commitment issues. There is still a spark between Misato and Kaji, even if they are formal with each other. It's evident when Kaji embarrasses her to solicit a response from her, no matter how small. So, I understand that you're living with Katsuragi. Uh, yeah? Tell me something, is she still so... wild in bed? <laughs> what are you implying by that? It's because of her traumatic and mute past that his way of showing affection is to tease her in order to get her to feel something or speak outright. Back to Masato and Shinji's relationship, considering that Masato is nearly twice Shinji's age, he is still a child after all, and she's his commanding officer, any sexual aspect of the relationship goes past what is defined as moral in our society. When Shinji first meets Misato, it's not in person, but through an invitation photograph she sends him. The photo in and of itself is arousing, depicting Misato more as a love interest for Shinji than a mother figure. In episode 2, Misato jokingly suggests making passes at him while on the phone with Ritsuko. Now I think the largest breaking point comes in episode 23. Rei dies while trying to protect Shinji's life and realizes how much she loves him. After her death, Shinji is devastated as his relationship with Rei had really progressed to one of trust and companionship. However, he cannot bring himself to cry. Furthermore, he confines in Misato, and her response comes as a shock. She prepositions some sort of sexual comfort. To further define this, here's a digression. Throughout the show, Misato loses faith in several characters, but a primary example is Ritsuko. When they have a falling out later in the series, it does not sadden Misato in the same way Kaji's and Shinji's does. Asuka can be seen in this regard as well. She mourns her loss, but not in the same regard as Shinji's or Kaji's. Now I've already established that sex acts is one of the primary functions to determine the strength of relationships for Misato, and in this regard, sex should be seen as Misato's relationship barometer, in which if she has offered sex to someone, she must have some sort of deep emotional bond to that person, even if it isn't entirely romantic. However, this is the defining moment where she loses sight of her original connection to Shinji. Shinji rejects her proposal as A, he still sees her as a mother figure, so he would react negatively to the imposition of sex, and B, in episode 21, after Masato receives Kaji's voicemail, that's when she knows he's dead. She weeps at the loss of someone who truly loves her. Shinji hears her crying, but instead of going to her, he stays in bed covering his ears because he can't listen to her cry. This is because he knows he's still a child and doesn't know how to comfort her. Shinji is aware of their relationship, but he knows he can't be what Masato wants. Back to Masato's relationship with her father, the scene where he saves her life is interesting because it's the same hopeless affection she parallels in the end of Evangelion, where when she knows she'll die, she gives to Shinji hope, along with her father's necklace, and sees him off and kisses him before she dies. do the rest when you get back, okay? Now when Masato says, we'll do the rest when you get back, both her and Shinji know deep down that isn't true. Misato kissed Shinji to build him up, to get him to pilot the Eva one last time. 
Misato goes above and beyond what is expected in character portrayals in anime. She is refined to the point where everything she did was completely intentional and integral to understand her and the people around her. From the small flicker of emotion when Shinji is called to pilot an Ava against the newest angel, to how she lives at home with Asuka and Shinji, and even how she treats her relationship with Ritsuko. Her dying moments and actions are perfect to sum up what her character is. A guardian angel to Shinji, a person that uses her sexuality to further her own goals, whilst also also being a slave to her own inner turmoil. The characters of Evangelion were born out of the trials and tribulations that Hideaki Anno himself experienced mentally. Throughout his life, Anno has battled depression, a battle that he had been open about. <laughs> It isn't common seeing this kind of frankness in Japan about mental health. Ano brought his history of clinical depression into light using his animation, characters, and the show as a whole. Halfway through the production of Evangelion, Ano was creatively blocked and unable to further develop the character of Rei, so he asked a friend for a suggestion on some reading about mental illness in an attempt to better understand her. But unbeknownst to him, that this book he picks up would be an awakening for him, a diagnosis of his own problems in life. Ano had been struggling with depression all these years and hadn't had the language or understanding for it or even accepted that it could be a clinical diagnosis. As such, Evangelion changed after Anno recognized his own life struggle. The series became more tragic and more apocalyptic. The final two episodes of the series is less of a closing chapter and more of a metaphysical journey throughout the human psyche, as Shinji is put on a psychologist's couch of sorts, questioning his very existence and confronting his darkest neuroses. He becomes an avatar by proxy for anyone who has given themselves a hard time over giving themselves a hard time, and this makes Shinji more relatable to the audience than your typical shonen protagonist. The TV show finished on a relatively upbeat note as Shinji decides, in a roundabout way, to start loving himself, thereby saving all of humanity in the process. The reception for the ending was mixed to say the least. Ano had received death threats from fans regarding the ending. For me, I'm trying to work hard for society and people who love anime, but there was this thread on how to kill Hideaki Anno. They kept writing the absolute best ways to kill me, such as, I could be killed this way or that. When I saw this, I stopped caring about everything, like making anime. I'd had enough. The scene in the end of Evangelion where the picture of the vandalized Gainax studio front and the emails, followed by a shot of Lilith's head decapitating, represent Anno's disappointment with the Ava fanbase. There's a common misconception that Anno created End of Ava as a fuck you towards anyone entitled enough to demand a definitive ending, but that's simply not the case. This scene, and the opening scene where Shinji confines in Asuka, can be seen as a critique of otaku culture. Here's a quote I gathered where Anno had this to say about otaku culture. I say critical things towards otaku, but I don't reject them. I only say that we should take a step back and be self-conscious about these things. I think it's perfectly fine so long as you act with an awareness of what you are doing, self-conscious and cognizant of the current situation. I'm just not sure it's a good thing to reach the point where you cut yourself off from society. I don't understand the greatness of society either. So I have no intention of going so far as to call for people to give up otaku-like things and become more suited to society. Only, I think there are more, many other interesting things in the world, and we don't have to reject them. In End of Eva, the world is coming down around Shinji's ears, and one can almost hear Anno screaming, I can't take this anymore, in tandem with his traumatized on-screen alter ego. Ultimately, the characters of Evangelion are a reflection of Anno himself. Shinji and Asuka in particular represent both sides of Anno. One side wanting to run and hide, while simultaneously wanting the world around him to change, and the other holding high expectations to achieve more. Evangelion isn't about what you expect, but what it is. Looking into Evangelion is like looking into the mind of Hideaki Anno. Someone can tell you what it means, but you, and you alone, have to find out what it means to you.
There is a lifetime of pain and suffering that we all endure on a mental level with terrible experiences with others, but it is a pain that is necessary to endure rather than just live a life of solitude and cosmetic interactions. Neon Genesis Evangelion is, and always has been, a story of personal existence, how to reinterpret it, how to fine tune it, and how to understand it so you can fight your own personal demons. The focus on the characters, their mental health, and the traumas in their lives make the conclusion that much more affecting and powerful. The core message of the show is that true peace and happiness do not come when all of our preferences are finally met, but when we at last set them aside, when we cease judging the value of life on what is given, and instead embrace the givenness of life. Riding his baloney pony. Did it know? Did it know? Did it know?